All right, let's get right into the teaching this morning for this special Mother's Day message. We're going to start in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1. And I've entitled this morning's message for the moms, and it's for everyone, of course. God's word's always for all of us. But the, the, the main theme this morning, of course, is towards the moms, and it's entitled A Mother's Instruction. Looking at the impact that a mother has on her children, and really a grandmother even on her grandchildren. The scripture has a lot to say about this, actually. A mother's instruction. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding... To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Verse 6, to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. For they will be a graceful ornament on your neck, on your head rather, and chains about your neck. And so Proverbs, the book of wisdom, the, the book of, of really uh, wisdom that is just distilled wisdom, pure wisdom written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, by King Solomon. Solomon, who was the wisest man, the Bible says, who ever lived. Of course, uh, Jesus Christ is God, and so Jesus is uh, um, omniscient and omnipotent. So Jesus is wiser, of course. That uh, goes without really uh, having to be said. But humanly speaking, Solomon, God granted him such tremendous wisdom that you could still read the book of Proverbs and you'll still glean things on, on, on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, I have read the book of Proverbs pretty much every day uh, without exception. Sometimes I miss a day for whatever reason and then I'll make it up the next day. But, but probably now for, I'm 50 years old, I got saved when I was 24. So for the last 26 years, I've been reading the book of Proverbs every single day. And you start in Proverbs chapter 1. On the first day of the month, you read Proverbs 1. On the second day of the month, you read Proverbs 2. On the 15th day of the month, you read Proverbs 15. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. You never have more than 31 days in a month. And so every month, you could start over again. And I believe that God does give wisdom to those who invest into studying uh, His Word and studying this, uh, again, distilled wisdom in the book of Proverbs. We know that this was, <clears throat> this was King Solomon, who was the son of King David. This, these were his writings for his son, uh, Rehoboam. And that he was writing this to, to train up his son in the ways of the Lord. And, and, and sadly, Solomon uh, uh, deviated from the course for many decades of his life and, uh, and came back uh, uh, online at the end of his life. But uh, Solomon started out very, very well, actually, and I believe he wrote uh, the majority of the book of, of Proverbs when he, was, when he was younger rather than when he was older and cynical. He wrote Ecclesiastes when he was old and cynical, and you, you certainly see the difference. But Proverbs is, is written uh, to children uh, primarily here, and it's, it's not just the father's instruction that is referenced in the book of Proverbs. It's also the mother's instruction to the children. Because practically speaking, a lot of times, especially in Bible times, the dads were out working or they were fighting in wars or they were planting, you know, uh, you know gardens and, and, and fields and crops and harvesting them and, uh, or, or working, you know, uh, out on fishing boats and, and bringing in the catch. Uh, and so the men, you know, they weren't around very much at home. They were working most of the time. That's why God gave them a Sabbath day's rest. Otherwise, they probably would have worked themselves to death in, in this culture uh, because that's what you had to do uh, to, to provide for your family. So primarily, the teaching and the instruction, especially of the younger children, would have come almost exclusively from mom, from the mother. And so a mother's instruction 
hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law or the instruction or the commandments or the teachings of your mother. Now, we're told in uh, 2 Timothy, and I'm going to be jumping around a little bit here this morning. Uh, in second, And we'll be back in Proverbs. We're going to start in Proverbs and we're going to end in Proverbs. But 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul says this about Timothy, this young pastor who he wrote these letters, first and second Timothy to. He says, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, Paul writing to Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. So Paul the apostle is actually recognizing and referencing the Bible teaching instruction that Timothy received as a child and as a young man, not from his father, but from his grandmother and from his mother. And Timothy, of course, uh, was a great man of God. And, and you see the impact and the influence that these women had uh, upon his life. As a matter of fact, Paul says this in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 14. He says, but you... To this young pastor must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, who taught Timothy the Holy Scriptures that Paul's referencing here when he was a child? From childhood, you've known the Holy Scriptures. Well, it was obviously, he just told us, it was his grandmother and his mother. And so the instruction uh, of a mother uh, in, a, in a child's life is so integral, it's so important. You know, we know in the scriptures that in the nuclear family, which is, of course, the, the biblical family and the biological family and all the rest, you have a father, which is a man, you have a mother, which is a woman, and then they reproduce, and, and biologically, the reproduction, they bring forth children, and so that's the nuclear family. We know that scripturally, biblically, the dad is the spiritual leader, he's supposed to be the protector and the provider, he's supposed to be the leader of the home. The mom is the heart of the home. The mom is the nurturer in the home. The mom is the encourager in the home. She's the comforter in the home. She's the one that the child runs to when they scrape their knees or, 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 or they uh, have a hard day at school. And the mom is the one who takes them in her arms and comforts them and encourages them. She also is to teach the next generation in order to pass on the faith to the next generation. Uh, Pastor Chuck Smith talks about how his mother dedicated him in the womb while he was in the womb. That his mother dedicated Pastor Chuck Smith to the Lord and then just really just indoctrinated him with scripture memor memorization and reading the Bible from the time that he was two or three years old. And, and Chuck Smith went on to be one of the greatest pastors and one of the greatest Bible teachers in a hundred years in this country. And Chuck gives credit to his mom. It's It's incredible. The, the impact and the influence that a mother has upon her children. There's also, of course, correction. There's discipline. That is also part uh, of training up a child uh, in the ways of the Lord. We're told in the book of Colossians, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18, <clears throat> again, God's uh, instruction manual for the family and the home. Wives, submit to your own husbands as it's fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And fathers, verse 21 of Colossians 3, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. And so you have the order that's in the home. And, and you know, the, the husband is to lay down his life for his wife as Christ laid down his life 
for the church, which means it's sacrificial love. It's agape love. It's the, the love that yields. It's the, it's the love that perseveres. It's the love that is patient and kind and long-suffering and, and, and it's unconditional. This is, this is the love that the, the husband is supposed to have for the wife. Because a wife can trust the husband who loves like that, then she could trust him to be the spiritual leader of the household and she could respect him. And really that's what a, what a man really desires from his wife more than anything uh, is, is respect. Then you have the children and the command to the children uh, is, or, is that the children are to obey their parents. That's mom and dad in all things for this is well pleasing to the Lord and fathers don't provoke your children, you know, lest they become discouraged and so we see uh, in the scriptures the instructions given to to the husband uh, to the wife to the father to the mother and even to the children now we obviously are going to spend today talking about moms and about the impact and the influence uh, and, and the instruction from the word of god to the moms uh, with this great task and this great responsibility to train up the next generation uh, in the ways of the lord Turn to Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. Titus chapter 2 and verse 1 says this. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love and in patience, that the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, or submissive literally is what it means, to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So again, there's instruction here to the older man, and there's instruction here to the older women. And, and so, you know, all, all, you know, of us are getting older and, and, and you know, we all started off young and, and, and we all are getting older and, and eventually we're all going to, you know, die and, and we're going to be in heaven. And that's the, that's the end of the story. But along the way, we hit different seasons of life. And, and, and you know, uh, when you're 17, 18, 15, 13, you think you know it all, but you don't know anything. I thought I knew it all when I was that age too. And then you hit, you know, 40 and 50 and some of you 60 and 70. And, and, and you look at me at a, as a 50-year-old and think, well, you don't learn, know anything yet at 50. I mean, wait till you hit 75 and then you'll really know what life is about and, you know, how things work. And so the older women... This is really the, the, the women that no longer have the, the very young children in the home. Uh, and, and they're not dealing with uh, the daily care of, of the young children and the babies. Those years are past. And now it's the, it's the time to teach the other younger women these things. And the older women themselves, and this would be for all women, obviously. This is not just for the older women or, or the younger women. When the scripture speaks about this, this is uh, generally accepted truth and knowledge and wisdom that we would be wise to pay attention to. If God is talking to the older women, he's talking to all of the women uh, indeed. He says, the older women likewise, verse 3, that they be reverent in their behavior. This is reverent toward God. This is revering God. This is honoring the Lord. This is putting God first. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added unto you. And so women, especially those who are older than the, the age in, when you're in your 20s and you have little ones running around in diapers and so forth, because again, that's a whole different season of life. But, but these are the women uh, who are going to be role models uh, to the younger women, to the younger moms. They're, they're the women who are, are going to be supporting their husbands uh, in, in, in the work of the Lord. And it says, be reverent in your behavior. It says, not slanderers. So reverence, holiness, or, or respect in your behavior toward God, not slanders. And so God is, is very concerned with our words. God is very concerned with what comes out of our mouth. He's very concerned with our uh, tongue. As a matter of fact, the scriptures say that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so this is something that is, is actually uh, a, a very, very prominent theme in the scriptures. We have to watch our tongue. He says in James, God says in James chapter 3 and verse 2, 
For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us to turn their whole body. Look at the ships, although they are large and driven by fierce winds. They are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, James 3, 5, the tongue is a little member and it boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity, the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets fire on the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. He goes on to say in verse 8, No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison, for with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth produce blessing and cursing, my brethren. These, these things ought not to be so. So James is telling us basically what Paul told Titus about for the older women, the instruction for the older women. We have to watch our words. All of us have to watch our words because our words are very, very powerful. Again, our words can destroy and tear down or our words can edify and they can build up. And he says, uh, if we bless God and our Father with our tongues, and then we turn and we curse men who have been made in the image of God, it is a contradiction. So our words, our tongues, the command uh, to the women uh, to not be slanderers with their tongues. In Proverbs and chapter 18 and verse 21, the Proverbs say this, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its Fruit. And so just understand that, that your words do have power. Uh, you know, the, the old saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me, is not true at all. Because words can be uh, even more destructive sometimes uh, than, uh, than a fist or, or, or than, you know, a, a slap. In Psalms chapter 34 and verse 11 the Dave, David, the psalmist, says this, Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So again, when we see instructions given... To us, that's for all of us. Again, the focus is on the moms this morning, but really this is generally uh, accepted truth for every one of us. We want to learn first the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is, is to fear being out of God's will and, and to fear being living in sin and to fear breaking God's heart and to fear even the consequences of our sin because whatever a man sows, this also shall he reap. He says, who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good. In other words, someone who wants to have a good, long life. Here's the instruction. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Our words matter. We have to guard our tongues. We have to think before we speak and not just speak reactively or, or even just from our flesh. We have to speak truthfully. We have to speak truth in love. Even mothers to their children speaking truth in love. And this is a, a way for us to raise up our children and teach them these things as well. But we also have to be demonstrating this for them. We have to be modeling this for them. Not speaking deceit. Not being liars. Not being those who just quickly uh, bend the truth and tell a lie. Uh, just because uh, no one else sees or no one else knows or perhaps you don't think that you're going to get caught. We have to be truth tellers. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 3, he says, He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Guard, guard our tongues. Remember, our tongues can, can set a fire ablaze, and, and James has burned down a whole forest with our tongues. Uh, again, uh, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword, and the pen is something that you write and someone reads, and it's words. Words are very, very powerful. 
In Psalm chapter 35, we read this about our words and what we should be speaking to one another. Psalm 35 in verse 27, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. Let them say continually, the Lord be magnified, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all day long. So let the righteous continually say the Lord be magnified. Those are the words that should be coming out of our mouths, especially in our homes, especially with our, our families, with our children. Let God be magnified in, in your life. Let God be magnified even in your words. Let God be magnified in your home. He says that my tongue speak of your righteousness and of your praise all day the day long. Those are the words that we should be speaking, not tearing down, not destroying, uh, not harming what, with our words, but building up and edifying and, 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 and teaching the next generation to fear and love the Lord. In Psalm 39, David says this in verse 1, I said, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. Good advice, David. Even when the wicked are before you, it's best, best to uh, choose your words carefully uh, because fools love an argument. And uh, a lot of times it's, it's bait to try and get a reaction so that you can, you know, lose control of yourself, really. You know, once, you, once you're out of control, then someone else can control you. And so David says wisely, I will guard my tongue lest I sin, uh, guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. We have to guard our words and choose our words carefully. It's the fool that just babbles and, and, and blabs whatever is coming out of their mouth. In Psalm 71 in verse 22 related to our tongue and our words. Also with the lute I will praise you and your faithfulness, O oh my God. So singing praises to the Lord, worshiping the Lord as we were doing earlier today. To you I will sing with the harp, O Holy One of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you, and my soul, which you have redeemed. My tongue, verse 24, also shall talk of your righteousness all the day long. For they are confounded, for they are brought to shame who seek my hurt. And so he says we should be singing praises to the Lord with our tongues. We should be using our, our voices and our tongues to magnify God, to sing praises to the, to, to, to the Lord, to worship the Holy One of Israel. He says, my tongue shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you. My tongue shall talk of your righteousness all the day long. Speaking God's righteousness, actually speaking God's word. In Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the whole Bible, Psalm 119 and verse 169 says this, let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. 171 of Psalm 119. My lips shall utter praise. For you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word. For all your commandments are righteous. These are the words that we should be saying. Instead of slandering, we should be building up. Instead of just ranting and raving and, and, and just, you know, giving people a piece of our mind, we should be sharing God's word in love, especially with our children, especially uh, those in the home. And the whole chapter of, of Psalm 119 <clears throat> pertains to and relates to the word of God and the commandments of the scriptures. In Psalm 119 and verse 1, we read this. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with a whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with a brightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. So all about walking in the word of God, not walking in iniquity. Iniquity is doing your own thing. Again, 
Not my will, but thy will be done. Is, it should be our prayer every single day that we pray, God, not my will be done on earth, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so moms, in training up your children, in speaking life to your children, this is the greatest thing that you could give your kids or your grandkids is to instill in them the word of God, to plant the word of God deep into their hearts and into their minds. He says, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's the word of God that keeps us from sin because it's the word of God that tells us the dangers of sin and the consequences of sin. And if you do this, then this is going to happen. And so uh, the word of God instructs us and teaches us and keeps us on the straight and narrow path that leads to life. So important uh, in the scriptures, what we say uh, with our words, especially uh, our words to our children in our homes. Again, back in Titus and chapter 2 and verse 3, it says the women that they should be reverent or holy or respectful in their behavior, not slanderers, careful with their words, not given to much wine. So this means a, a life of self-control, a, a life of moderation. The word temperance, which is not, you know, something that people don't even really know probably today what the word temperance means. They used to name their children temperance and, you know, and, and patience and, and, and so forth. Uh, and temperance is, is self-control. It's not being controlled by your old nature, not being controlled by your flesh anymore. You have self control actually it's it's one of the aspects of the fruit of the spirit which is love and love is broken down and one of the aspects of love is self control love is patient and love is kind love controls oneself teachers of good things so again not slanders but but contrary you're teaching good things you're teaching uh the the truth you're teaching the word of god even just reading the scriptures that they may admonish the young women, verse 4, to love their husbands, to love their children. So again, these are the women in the church who already have raised their children, and, and they don't have the young children in the home anymore. Uh, but they are now to teach the other young women with the young children to love their husbands, to love their children. Because as, as, as you all know, this is the most difficult season of life for, for, for most women, and it's probably the greatest season of their life, is when they have young children in the house, especially if you've got two or three of them you know, under five or whatever, it's, it's a lot of work and you never get a break. And so those young moms need to be encouraged by the women who have gone through that season of life, encouraging the young women uh, to love their husbands, to love their children, and teaching the younger women to be discreet, to be chaste, that is to be modest, actually, to be homemakers, not necessarily career makers there's nothing wrong with having a career but if you have to sacrifice you know um, your children for your career then there's a problem and obviously uh, in this culture uh, most uh, folks need to have both parents working it's just the reality of the generation that we live in today uh, but don't make your career your focal point make your children the, the priority especially when you have young children in the home because you only get those years for for, for for so many years where they're just little sponges. I mean, really up until age five or six, their little brains are still developing and they're literally sponges taking in everything uh, around them. So those are, are the times where the discipline and the love and the instruction and the teaching and the ways of the Lord are so critical. Homemakers, there's nothing wrong. Women, there's nothing wrong with being a homemaker. The Bible says it's a good thing. For the older women to teach the younger women, it's okay to be a stay-at-home mom. There's nothing wrong with that. Our culture has got everything so backwards, and look at the mess that we're in with, with, with the kids as a result. Again, instructing the young women, verse 5, to be good, to be obedient to their own husbands. And it's really, obedient is a bad translation of the word. It's, it, women, are, wives are never commanded to obey their husbands. They're called to submit to their husbands. It's just like a... a ranking in the military you have the commander-in-chief you have the admiral you have the captain you have the plebe or the private 
And, and there's just a chain of command. That's all that God is saying is that the husband has that responsibility of being the head of the household, and God's going to hold that man accountable for that home. And so if uh, your husband is leading you in the ways of the Lord, then don't fight him on it. Allow him to be the spiritual leader of the home. That's basically what it's saying. You can't have two, two, two heads in a home. You can't have two people that are in charge because you'll never get anywhere. Someone has to yield to someone else. And the scripture says that, that the husband uh, is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So teaching these women to love their husbands, to submit to their husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. It always comes back to the fact that people are watching us and that we are, you know, modeling for them what Christianity uh, is supposed to look like. Now, the children also have a responsibility. And, and we read this in Colossians chapter 3, that the children in Colossians 3.20 are to obey your parents. So the, the parents are to instruct, the moms are to teach and instruct and to, and to nurture and to uh, discipline their children in the ways of the Lord. And the children are to then take that instruction, that godly instruction, and to obey their parents. And that obey, the word does mean obey here. And that, that is obedience. Even if you don't agree as, as a child with your parent, you're still supposed to obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. As a matter of fact, the command was given right from the very beginning. Uh, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments... Uh, the fifth commandment is the first commandment with a blessing. And it says in Exodus 20, verse 12, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. So the children are to honor and respect their mother and their father. And they are to obey uh, their parents. And so you've got the parent's job, you've got the mother's job, you've got the children's job. In Deuteronomy and chapter 5, and verse 29, we read, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it may be well with them and with their children forever. God's always concerned for the next generation. Because if you don't pass your faith on to the next generation, guess what? It dies. The faith in your family will die. There's literally churches that are dead churches. They're empty churches that were once some of the biggest churches in the country, biggest churches in the world, because the faith was not transferred to the next generation. And so God says, oh, that it, if they would oh, fear me, respect me, honor me, and always keep my commandments so that it will go well with them and with their children. So children are supposed to be submissive. They're supposed to be uh, obedient to their parents. And there's a promised blessing there for the kids that obey their parents. And the kids that disobey their parents, there's trouble uh, that often comes as a result. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24, we're told that parents are actually supposed to discipline their children. This would include moms disciplining their children, not just fathers. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him properly, or promptly rather. He who spares his rod hates his son. So you have the mother's job, you have the father's job, you have the child's job. When the child doesn't obey, the child doesn't respect, the child doesn't submit, the child's still uh, under your roof, then there is discipline that is supposed to take place. And again, if you discipline your kids when they're little, you, you, you know, won't have as much trouble with them <laughs> when they're older. I remember doing a ride-along with a, a friend that attended uh, my church in, our church in Tehachapi, and he was a, um, a deputy sheriff. He's a sergeant now with uh, L.A. County Sheriff's Department. And I did a ride-along with him in Palmdale, Lancaster area on the, the bad side of town. He wanted to show me kind of what was going on in our backyard. And, and uh, you know, I was just appalled, just appalled by, by, by these kids. And he ended up, you know, hooking up these, these kids with, with handcuffs and throwing them in the back of the car. And just the stuff that these kids were saying. I mean, they were 16. Turns out they were 16, 17 years old. And he was just trying to, to scare them. But um, they were terrible. These kids were horrible, horrible human beings. And, you, you know, it's just a terror to think of what they are today because this was 20 years ago. Uh, but 
I, I asked him the question. I said, I, is it really true that it's illegal to spank your kids? Because this was at the time where they were, parents were afraid to spank their children. I had young children at the time. And I said, is it really true that, you know, if you spank your kids, you give them a little paddle on the butt or, you know, you uh, take, take a wooden spoon or, or something and you spank them on the rear end that, you know, they'll actually come, CPS will come and take your kids away and that parent will get locked up. And he says, he says, absolutely not. He says, as a matter of fact, I wish that the parents would spank their children. He says, if these parents spanked these kids when they were three, they wouldn't be out here selling dope at 16 on the corners. And this is from uh, someone in law enforcement. So discipline uh, is, is part of love, actually. Disciplining our children is part of helping to keep them on the straight and narrow path. And, and again, because uh, the mom is primarily the one who is spending the majority of the time with the children, it shouldn't always be wait till your father gets home. It should be let's nip this in the bud now and, and, and let's take care of business and make sure that we get correction uh, in the home. Again, especially when you start when they're, when they're young. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5, we're told this about discipline. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you are enduring chastening, then God deals with you as sons. For what son or daughter is there whom a father or mother does not chasten? A parent, a loving parent will discipline a child that they love. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? And so God says this, that if you're not disciplining your children, then you really don't love your children. It's very, very powerful, because he says, a father who loves his son disciplines his son. Again, I remember Pastor Chuck uh, saying, you know, um, if you're in a, in a grocery store and there's a screaming child throwing a temper tantrum because they're not getting their way, they're not getting what they want and just melting down and making a scene, Chuck said, it's not my job to spank that kid. You just feel sorry for that parent and you shake your head because you're like, wow, wait till this kid's a teenager. But it is the job of the parent to spank that kid. That's how you know that this is your child. You don't spank someone else's children. That's their parent's job. But you're responsible to discipline your children. You see, that's God's commandment. And that is evidence of love that you love them, especially if they're off track, if they're going in the wrong direction, because God loves us enough to correct us, to get us back on track. And it always, always comes back to the word of God teaching them God's word, instructing them in God's word, correcting them according to the scriptures. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I told you we were going to be jumping around a lot here today. We will be back in Proverbs at the end, though. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 1, we read this. Now, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. Verse 2, that you may fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson. Notice God is so concerned about the next generation. All the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you. And that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. God just wants to bless his, the people's socks off. He wants to bless his people. And here's what he says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And so the blessing comes as you put God first. The blessing comes as you love the Lord with your whole heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. Then he says this in verse 7, You shall teach them diligently to your children. <clears throat> What's he speaking of teaching? The statutes, the judgments, the statutes, the commandments. 
the word of God. Teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, diligently teaching the children the word of God all the time, always looking for opportunities to, to instruct. And again, uh, as your children get older, you have less and less of these opportunities, and the world creeps in, and you know, other ideas, and children as teenagers rebel. You probably rebelled as a teenager. I know I certainly rebelled as a teenager, and so, you know, that's part of the, uh, you know, becoming an adult and all the rest. So a lot of this, I would say, is more applicable when you have young children in the home, if you, or if you can instruct and encourage young moms that this is the key. Teach them diligently, and young dads for that matter, teach them diligently God's word to your children. Talk of them, the word of God, the statutes of the Lord, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. This is the idea where he says, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and of your gates, that people put scriptures up on their walls. This is the, the, the verse uh, that would give that instruction so that the word of God is honored uh, in your home. Uh, as Joshua said, may we all be able to say, as for my house, we will serve the Lord. As for my house, I don't know what's going on in your house, and I don't know what's going on down the street or next door. But as for me, for my house, <laughs> we're going to serve the Lord. This home is dedicated to God. In Psalm 19 and verse 7, we read this about the word of God, the perfection and the beauty of God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. The blessing of obeying God's word. You just uh, can never, you know, outgive God. And if you give your life to him and you surrender uh, every day to him, God uh, will bless you and you will walk in a blessed life. Not necessarily prospering financially and all the rest, because oftentimes uh, money and, and finances and worldly success will destroy you. But it's, it's the blessings of the real things, the joy and the peace and the presence of God in your life and the wisdom to avoid the pitfalls uh, of the enemy. In Psalms chapter 1 and verse 1, we read, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Making your delight in your home the, the, the word of God, meditating on the Lord, thinking about the Lord day and night. And God says you will be fruitful in your life. You will bear much fruit. Okay, let's turn back to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, and we're just going to make our way through some scriptures in the Proverbs that pertain to these subjects that we've already uh, addressed. And this is, again, primarily directed toward the moms here this morning, but the Word of God, of course, applies to all of us. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. For they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. In other words, they're going to be a blessing to you. The instruction of your parents will be a blessing to you. There will be something that you will greatly treasure uh, later on in life, like a beautiful uh, headdress or, or, or beautiful chains around your neck. The instruction of a mother, the teachings of a mother. Well, what are some of the teachings that he's referring to that you are to instruct your children in? Verse 10, my son or my daughter, if sinners entice you, do not consent 
If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. He says, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. And so, instructing your children not to go around with evil people, not to follow evil influences or evil influencers. You have to be careful what you're digesting and what you're consuming, even on social media, because it affects our our mind, it affects our heart, it affects our thinking, and we are to run away and teach our children to run away from evil influences. We know that the scriptures tell us uh, that bad company corrupts good morals. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, that we are all affected and impacted uh, by peer pressure. And, and, th- and that is just something that it, that's human nature. And so uh, we have to be sure that we are associating with those who are going to uh, lead us in the right ways and not take us uh, uh, off the straight and narrow path that leads to life. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20, we read, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. And so be careful who you hang out with. Be careful who you are associating with. Be careful who is influencing uh, your, your decisions and your thinking. Because, uh, again, um, bad company corrupts good morals. That's something that parents should be teaching their children. In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 1, Hear, my, ch- my children, the instruction of a father. Give attention to understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother. Now Solomon's talking about his mother Bathsheba. And no doubt Bathsheba was someone who instructed Solomon greatly uh, in the word of God. That would be the implication, the takeaway, as he talks about his mom uh, throughout the book of Proverbs. He says, he also taught me and said, here's some of the instruction you're supposed to be teaching your children. Let your heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. She will deliver to you. And and then it goes on to talk about wisdom and and wisdom from the word of God. uh, Knowing right and wrong. Understanding uh, truth and lies. He says in verse 14, do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on, for they do not sleep unless they've done evil. Their sleep is taken away unless they make someone fall, for they eat the bread of wickedness and they drink the wine of violence. So again, instructing your children, don't go with the wicked, don't walk in the evil way, avoid it, don't travel on it. Turn away from it, pass on, because you will regret it. Whatever a man sows, this also shall he reap, and so we do suffer the consequences of our actions. And many of us, you know, we try and instruct our children to avoid the same mistakes that we made. We try and tell them, don't do this because I did it and I regret it. I wish I wouldn't have done this. And so it is uh, the idea uh, of warning your children and instructing them about which path uh, to walk on and, and that there's consequences for our actions. For every action, there is a reaction. And whatever seeds we plant, there's going to have to be a harvest from those seeds that we plant that we're going to have to eat. If we sow to the flesh, Galatians 6, 9, and 10, we're going to reap of the flesh destruction. But if we sow to the Spirit, we reap of the Spirit eternal life. He says, the path of the just, verse 18, is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them Stumble. So the path of the just, the path of the righteous, the one seeking to follow the Lord, 
is like the shining sun that shines brighter unto the perfect day. So many great uh, instructions here in the book of, of Proverbs for us to teach to our children. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 6, he speaks about diligence and instruction in, in being hardworking and diligent. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. So the Bible instructs us to teach our children to be diligent, to be hard workers, and to not be slothful uh, and lazy. And he says, even look at nature, look at the ant. You know, they just go out there and they just do their thing. They're just always working. They're always on the job. They, they never take a break. Even when they're, you know, at night when they're down in their little nest, they're still working down there. And then the sun comes out and they're back out there working again. And he says, learn, even from nature. They don't ever have to worry about what they're going to eat or where they're going to live because they're always taking care uh, uh, of providing for the needs uh, of the colony. <clears throat> in Proverbs 13, 4, he says, The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. There's, God honors hard work, and God, you know, uh, opposes um, laziness. He says in Proverbs 16, 6, <clears throat> These are the six things that the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. This is something, matter of fact, you know, it's good to read the Proverbs to your children. It's good to read your, the Proverbs, you know, even uh, to your spouse or to read it as a family. Because there's so much here that is so instructive for all of us. But <clears throat> if there's seven things that God hates, that God says, I hate these things, these are an abomination to me, then these are seven things that I want to avoid and I want to teach my children to avoid. A proud look. God hates the proud, but he exalts the humble. <clears throat> a lying tongue. <clears throat> God hates lies and deception. He uh, even says uh, that you shall not bear false witness to your neighbor. It's one of the Ten Commandments, that we are not to lie to one another. Hands that shed innocent blood. You think of uh, our topic yesterday, the uh, idea of, of the shedding of innocent blood in the womb through abortion. Uh, just something that God absolutely hates. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies. So again, back to this idea of, uh, of liars and, and not speaking truth with our words. And one who sows discord among the brethren. <clears throat> That's someone who's trying to divide and, and someone who's trying to split up and to, and, and to cause conflict because a house divided against itself cannot stand. God, God hates that. One who plants seeds of discord in order to create division, especially uh, in the home. There are warnings against the ungodly women that uh, men need to learn, and, and mothers especially, to teach their children. He says in verse 20 of Proverbs 6, My son, keep your father's command. Do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light and reproof of instruction are the way of life to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of the seductress. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. And so women, you need to teach your sons especially to be wary of those Jezebel women that are out there, those women uh, who are the harlots, those women who are out to just destroy or just to take uh, anything that they can from a man because they get them wrapped around their little finger and primarily through, uh, th through sex and through lust. And so this is a great instruction for moms to teach their children to avoid the Jezebel, uh, uh, avoid, you know, Potiphar's wife, avoid uh, Delilah, right? I mean, we get these examples in the scriptures of women who just played, uh, tried to play men and, and, and did play some of these men. 
In Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 1, he says, My son, keep my words, treasure my commands within you, keep my commands and live. And my law is the apple of your eye, bind them on the, your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to my to your wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. Good instruction, especially to teach uh, our, our boys, our sons, for the women to teach their sons, the moms. In Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, he says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me, the fear of the Lord, your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you're wise for yourself. If you scoff, you bear it. Alone. So again, teaching our children to fear the Lord, to realize that God is always watching us. He's always watching us. There's nothing hidden from his eyes, from his sight. So we're really actually never getting away with anything. We may think we're getting away. No one else knows, but God sees. And so instructing our children to walk in the fear of the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 16, speaking of wisdom from God, how much better to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. The material things of this world are just passing away, but God's word endures forever. These are the greatest treasures you can give your children. Let's skip to Proverbs 31. This is where we're going to end. And we see here, before we get into the virtuous woman or the virtuous wife, which is very well known, we see what Bathsheba, Samuel's, uh, or uh, Solomon's mom, said to him here. Proverbs 31, verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. We know that this was written by King Solomon, and so Lemuel must have been a, a, a pet name, a special name that Bathsheba gave to him. That was his nickname, Lemuel. What, my son, Bathsheba says to, to Solomon, what, my son, and what, son of my womb, and what, son of my vows, do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. You think of Ahab and Jezebel, or Samson and Delilah. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the justice of all the afflicted, Give strong drink to him who's perishing and wine to those whose hearts are bitter. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember his misery no more. So uh, again, to be sober-minded was the instruction from his mom. He would have done well to listen to his mom because later on he kind of threw all that caution to the wind. King Solomon did. You read it in the book of Ecclesiastes. But she's saying, don't, don't, don't be out of you know, your right frame of mind. Don't be under the power, the influence of drugs or alcohol. She says, open your mouth, verse 8, for the speechless, and in the cause of all who are appointed to die, open your mouth, judge righteously, plead the cause of the poor and the needy. A mother teaching her son to be considerate of, of, of the downtrodden, of the less fortunate. And then we read about the virtuous wife, the virtuous woman, the, the gold standard for, for every woman that no woman has ever achieve because there's no perfect woman uh, on the planet like there's no perfect man on the planet but this is the goal this is this is the platinum standard uh, to to uh, try and uh, look up to and to try and live out who can find a virtuous wife or a virtuous woman for her worth is far above rubies the heart of her husband safely trusts her so he will have no lack of gain she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She's like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night, provides food for her household and a portion for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her profit, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. Her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. 
She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Again, this is, you know, the epitome uh, of the perfect wife and mother and woman. And, and I don't believe that this actually exists in real life. So don't feel bad that you're thinking, well, I'm not that and I'm not that. Well, no one is. This is just the standard. This is, this is to try and live up to this standard of the righteous and, and virtuous wife. And then here's what he says. Strength and honor, verse 25, are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. The godly wife, the godly mother, the godly grandmother, this defines her. Strength and honor are her clothing. And she shall rejoice in time to come. God uh, will bless and God will honor uh, her faith and her love for her family and her sacrifices. God sees it all. She opens her mouth with wisdom as we had just studied all about the wisdom of God's word, the instruction, the teachings, the edification, the correction, the warnings. And on her tongue is the law of kindness. Again, that the heart of the home, the, the mom is the heart of the home. Kindness and, and, and unconditional love for her children. She watches over the ways of her household. She does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also he praises her, and now this is her husband speaking about her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing away, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. That is the key. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, it's passing away, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And if you fear the Lord, that means that you just are going to seek to love the Lord, to honor the Lord, to serve the Lord. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. There may be consequences from your past that you cannot control. But you could start today and say, you know, as for me and my house starting today, uh, we will serve the Lord. This house is dedicated to God, and we are going to honor the Lord. We are going to exalt his name. We're going to magnify his word in this place. I always have a hard time with Mother's Day messages because it's so uh, kind of off topic on my usual themes that I teach, and so I ask the women to please bear with me patiently on these Mother's Day messages because uh, I, I end up pretty much giving a full uh, indoctrination of, uh, of sermons and teaching to, to, to everyone, not just to the moms on Mother's Day, and uh, perhaps I, I, you know, could do better as a pastor with with that maybe maybe i can learn to do just something right for the moms but what i think that happens is when you're only exclusively teaching to the moms only on mother's day then everyone else kind of tunes out because not everyone who's here uh, and is watching online is is a mom necessarily uh, but again we want to honor the moms uh i'm thankful for my beautiful wife and uh godly a woman who who i share my wife with my life with and um, thankful for all of the godly women who are here in this place. We honor you. Uh, we appreciate you. We love you. We respect you. And God bless you as you are trying to uh, nurture and, and discipline and instruct the next generation uh, in the ways of the Lord. Shall we pray? And Father, we do, again, honor the moms here today. Everyone of the moms, from the youngest mom to the oldest, Lord, we ask your special blessing upon them, Lord. We thank you for who they are to us and what they mean to our lives, Father God. We pray for each one of us, Lord, that we would leave this place changed, Father, even though that this message was primarily for the moms, Lord. Your word is instructive and uh, is corrective for all of us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would all have taken something from your word today that we can apply to our own lives, Lord. And just like Joshua said, Lord, I pray that each one of us could say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, that you will be honored in our homes, you'll be honored in our lives. Bless the moms again, Father. Bless the rest of our day, we pray. And we thank you for this time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.